Java. We're going to start talking about Ruby on Rails and the Ruby ecosystem. That's, that's teed up next. And to do that, I'd like to invite Ian McFarland, Principal and VP of Technology at Pivotal Labs, a leader in the, in the industry up on stage with us. Thank you. Right here. So Ian, let's let's start. You know, with you know, what is what is Ruby Rails Sinatra? What are, what are they great at? Where where do these ideas come from, and what problems are they trying to solve? Well, honestly, they're really great at developer at, at producing customer value. They're really great at building applications really rapidly, uh, test driving them. Uh, the language, the dynamic language, is great for doing things that you normally would like on, on the Java side would have to do with. Uh, post compilation steps. These are things you can do with metaprogramming. These are things you have a really dynamic language in which to be able to do some some really neat stuff. Would you ever like write a pass itself out of Ruby? Maybe. Probably not. Probably not. We. I mean, did you? We did. We did. Well, we thought it was a great language for command and control of a system and orchestrating. There the are definitely large parts. pieces that you yeah. would want to do that with. I mean, yeah. I think, and when we see that, some of, some of our enterprise customers are using it for command and control of their entire operations. Yeah. So. What are some of the challenges? Um, you know, I, I got kind of bitten by the Ruby on Rails mm -hmm. thing and, and the ease of Ruby early on. Mm -hmm. um, but early on, Rails had one of the things that made it difficult to actually push into the cloud. It had what I called black magic, meaning <laughs> it had gems running around on your system somewhere. And if you actually looked at someone's application and said, tell me exactly what your app needs to run, which is what we need to do in the cloud, right. that was a struggle. Absolutely, and I think package management has gotten a lot better. I mean, I think this is natural. The early stages of any language, you're going to have people are hacking stuff together to make it work. I remember when I started working in Java back, like Java's like 1.0 alpha 2, right? The network libraries didn't even work. But you know, as as languages mature, you start to find that people really care about not just oh yeah, we're using this gem, but we're using this version of this gem with this API. And Bundler's helped a lot with that. I think, I mean, we're finally with, with Rails 3 and Bundler at a point where I think that's a lot more stable. So who, who's using Ruby? I mean, you guys are a big consulting shop and you build apps for your, right. your clients, but who are they? Are they little, are they, you know, startups? Are they big enterprises? Is there enterprise adoption or is it all Absolutely. just next gen? Uh, there, so that's changed a lot of the years. Five years ago when we started, when we this, there was this framework that nobody had heard of other than a bunch of, you know, the cool kids in the coffee shops. Um, the only people who would do Rails development were startups who didn't care about the means. They cared about, again, producing value. And so we started out in that space. We started out with early stage startups. I mean, we were Java consultancy before that, and our enterprise customers were using Java. We started out in the space of really building applications for early stage startups. We'd build, build the first application for them. It would grow, you know, something like a Twitter start out, starts out Rails application. You know, we, we actually came and helped them later on, but, uh, you know, so it was early stage companies originally, but that's, that value chain, the, the proof of value has, that, that's very compelling. And we've seen very forward looking companies, folks like Best Buy and EMI, uh, really big hardware company that I can't name, really big software company uh, that I can't name. Um, Salesforce, people like these. Are these guys, are they, are they toys? Are they throwing real load at these systems? Anybody running, you know, 100, Transactions a second. Absolutely. So, and again, I think this is the natural adoption curve. People start out with stuff that's not core line of business. People building little applications that help some of their business process. But if it goes down, no big deal. And then we saw like so, with something like Best Buy, where they were taking a new line of business, and it was going to be business critical once it was up and running. But they weren't converting to it. Uh, and then we've seen later, like in the last two years, we've seen companies start to take core business services. We had one client uh, trans uh, take their whole SOA. And make it into a rail uh, into, into a Ruby based runtime because they found the developer productivity was in, so compelling. And when you talk about orchestration, it's an incredibly good orchestration language. Now mm -hmm. I would imagine a lot of the startup companies might actually, uh, you know, center around let's say Ruby on Rails. Mm -hmm. But some of your bigger enterprise customers, do you ever see anyone just using one framework anymore? Uh, honestly, even in the startup space, you don't end up using one framework. So there's always a diversity of, of take the best tool for the job, that That's makes right. sense, and, and work from there. I mean, I think like Pivotal Tracker is a great example, right? It's a Rails application. First of all, Rails application probably today means mostly you're doing JavaScript, right? Because you don't have to write that much code on, for, the, for the CRUD stuff. But so it's a Rails and JavaScript application. Uh, but you know, it uses Solar for search, and that's a Java service. So I mean, even in like, and we find this almost all the time. Probably 80% of our applications are using, you know, Solar for search, or you know, obviously the database isn't written in in Rails. 
you know, maybe you're not using a data, you know, a, probably you're using a non-relational store or a mix of stores. So a tracker run on Cloud Foundry, you think, or are we? Uh, we haven't run it there yet. Weeks. But I mean, we do. We run it on the ESX. I think that it's really it should. There's nothing really that would prevent it from. What running percentage of your other there. customers, their apps would run in this environment? What so fifty percent, ten percent. Uh, I would think 90%. 90%. I mean, the fact is, we've been deploying two clouds ever since we started doing Rails, right? Like, I think that is the, the modern way to deploy applications. You should not be owning your, inf I mean, if you own your infrastructure, great, but that's a, that should be a business decision discrete from how you develop your application. Let's, uh, let's do some mm -hmm. demos now and, and take a look at some Rails apps in action and maybe get a quick tour of the system. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, apologies up front, I'm a, more of a command line guy. Um, me too. What I'm going to show you right now is a little bit of the command line interface and a simple app, and then we're going to actually show a Ruby on Rails app that we actually developed ourselves, and we are eating our own dog food, so to speak, in terms of we built the app in Rails and we're deploying it on ourselves. Um, but right now I have a, a, a small Foo app um, that I'm going to bring up, and this is a Sinatra app. Sinatra is a micro framework for Ruby. It's fun to play with and kind of get started, um, and this one is very, very simple, and it just says, Hello from Cloud Foundry. It tells you where it's running. Nothing, uh, no rocket science here, so to speak. Um, but what we'll have is we have the, the command line that we're going to use here, and I'm going to say, okay, where am I actually looking at? And so it actually shows you where we're pointing, and this is what Mark alluded to earlier. If all of these nouns and verbs I'm going to be going across, if I can all of a sudden just say VMC target over here and do the exact same thing, we think that's pretty powerful. Right now we're targeted at the, the service that Mark uh, talked about, cloudfoundry.com. It shows how much I'm using. So I'm going to go ahead and say VMC push foo. And I know that this app's going to run. So I'm going to give it a, a command line flag. And VMC is uh, VMC help and VMC help options. You'll see everything it can do. Um, and say, hey, I know what I'm doing. Just go ahead and do what I want. And it's going to go ahead, stage the application, start the application, and now it's running. So we'll go kind of go through, uh, let's see. And it's running in the cloud. Now, Cloud Foundry is based in the middle of the country. So what happened there is the local client actually staged the application, figured out what it needed to in terms of the application, sent over a resource manifest to the cloud. The cloud came back and said, look, the whole cloud community, everyone's secured and fingerprinted. I only need these two things. Send me those. Bundled it up, packaged it, said this is a Ruby app. I need a Ruby runtime. Asked for help throughout the massive cloud infrastructure in terms of running apps. Sent it over to it. It started to run. It bound to the port, it notified the dynamic router it was ready, and it was up there. So all of that happened in about two seconds or so. Now obviously this is kind of a very small app, um, and so we can actually go back to my fun Emacs buffer. And that's actually the whole app, which is one of the things I love about Sinatra. Yeah. That's like every line of code in this application. There's no magic. No magic. So now I said, you know, wow. So I, I don't know if you guys can you see run. that on the webcast, but essentially I've changed my application. And now it's like, what should I do? Well, I can say update foo. And so that one took about five seconds. And so the same steps are happening. And now as we're going to go through this talk, we're going to start seeing, oh, well, what happens when I target somewhere else? I'm sure I have to do different steps. And the answer is going to be no. You're not going to have to do any of that. So what we're going to walk through now is more of a Rails app, like right. not a toy that I always play with the toy apps. Well, um, honestly, we do a lot of, of Sinatra apps for in, sort of in development. We want to mock out some third-party API. Enterprise in particular, we do a lot of that. And so this is a Rails app. Um, and this is actually our landing page for when you actually go visit the site. So I'm going to let this one actually kind of walk me through interactively. So I'll call it uh, Dub2, D2. So it's going to say, do you want me to deploy from here? And I say, yes. Um, the concept of deploying a source-based application or a binary-based application like Java versus Ruby versus Node is, again, something about the open paths. We need to, su to support all of these frameworks and all of these things. So if you say, nope, I want to ship you binary type stuff in terms of a virtual machine, Java code, we handle that. So it, as you can see, it automatically detected that it's a Rails application. And what Mark talked about earlier was is that that is a framework. The system doesn't understand Rails per se in terms of how to run it. It understands Ruby and understands that Rails needs Ruby to run. But on the client side, where all the intellect is, because I can actually ask you a question and say, no, you're wrong, it says, I think this is a Rails app. 
and that's for staging things, auto wiring databases, and doing kind of fancy stuff before we hermetically seal this thing with a start and a stop button. And so I say, yep, you got it right. I'll give it 256 meg. Do I want any services? Ah, uh, sure, I'll give it a database. This is similar to what Romney Voss and Mark were showing. Now, if you don't want to answer yes, I imagine you can give all those on the command line right. so I can just do a scripted install. Correct, and, and, and the reason Mark highlights that is that's the first thing that Mark wanted. So what yes. Mark wants, Mark gets. Uh, but yes, you can pass all the flags in automatically. VMC can actually return JSON results. You can do all kinds of things in terms of scripting. We're hoping that the open platform is truly that. And the, set, the source code to that is open as, as well, right? In the VMC repo? Yes, for the, yeah. the client, correct. Yeah. So you can just basically wire up your own rake deploy. And so if I get the name right, I, I will get it. So this is going to be the landing page that everyone's going to see, and I actually think it's live right now. Um, but I actually just took the exact same source that we deployed this morning to the official URL and just deployed it to here. And again, this is a Rails 3 modern app using Bundler, losing lots of gem dependencies. We call out to a CAPTCHA service. We use a database. So hopefully you get the, the experience. And I think that, that was about the 15 seconds or so to get that is up. Is that running 1.8 or 1.9? It's running 1.8. Um, but we have uh, the concept of run times. Mm -hmm. So again, based on the target that we're pointing on, what, do you got, what does this cloud actually support? And you can see that it says, yep, I do Ruby 1.9. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say push W3. Don't ask me any questions, but hey, bind this to Ruby 1.9 for me. So this is kind of like running two versions of .NET side by side, only in the cloud, the DLL hell happens out there, right? Correct. <laughs> cool. Yeah. You're isolated so, from so it. So the challenges of Ruby, I guess to summarize the challenges of Ruby, it's a very fast moving okay. environment. So we, we have a 1.8 and we have 1.9. We have a lot of gems and flights, so we have to figure out, you can't just reference a uh, library by name, you want to seal it, and that's what Gemfiler and Bundler mm -hmm. are all about. And then, you know, just the transmission speed, and we use the differential update for that. So I think that we've got most of those challenges nailed in, in this system, and you guys can, can take a and look at it. And we're actually seeing, you know, it actually did not run, so I bet you there's a gem dependency we didn't put in for the website in there. Um, and we'll show some other websites and show how we actually figure out, okay, my app didn't work, what do we do about that? We're going to talk about that in a second. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, Ian. Thank thanks you. for joining thanks, us. Thanks, Ian. Thanks. So again, second platform out of the way. So again, Cloud Foundry is multi-platform, multi-language, one, one piece of system software, one pass.